so it's kind of intuitive that the higher energy light will accomplish more difficult tasks at the molecular level. And we'll go through each of the tasks that's being performed. But before we do that, I think it's important to go over the highest occupied molecular orbital, HOMO, and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, LUMO. And that will help us anchor our discussion of spectroscopy. And so the way that this works is usually with conjugated systems. And remember, a conjugated system is something where you have a double bond, then a single bond, and then a double bond again. So it's double, single, double. And remember that these double bonds involve a pi bond between two p orbitals. So you need the p orbitals to be intact for a double bond to happen. This needs to have a p orbital, and so does this molecule there, or this atom there. And what happens is if you have a conjugated system like this, notice that you have p orbitals on adjacent carbons here. So we have a p orbital here, and we have a p orbital there. But they're not yet forming a pi bond. However, because you have adjacent carbon atoms with p orbitals that are intact, that is the potential for a pi, a pi bond to be formed. And so what can happen is if the light comes in to the sample, the light could be at just the right energy level that it can bump an electron from this pi bond over here to form a new pi bond there, and that's what you see with resonance. That's when resonance occurs, it's when you bump the electrons from a pi bond like that over to create a new pi bond that's kind of a bridge between these two p orbitals. And this uh, can then result in some downstream effects of other, other electrons in pi bonds being excited up to a newer level. So this is the highest occupied molecular orbital, HOMO. And that is something that's at a fairly high energy, whereas this one here where it will end up going is the lowest unoccupied. Lowest unoccupied means that there's not too much of a difference between the energy level of the electrons in this pi bond and the energy level when they get bumped up and make a new pi bond between this atom here and the adjacent one. And so that is what happens when you bump something from HOMO to LUMO. And this is a very important thing that can help underscore a lot of our discussion of spectroscopy. So with that understanding, we can now move on to our highest energy type of spectroscopy. And I say that with quotes because it's not really spectroscopy for a reason that I'll explain momentarily. Essentially, when you get into levels of energy in the gamma range or higher, what ends up happening is you now have enough energy to break fairly rigid bonds. For example, a sigma bond between two things or a non-conjugated pi bond. And that means that you have the energy to actually break bonds and you can obliterate your compound by doing this. And so gamma rays often destroy their sample and for that reason, it's not very useful in spectroscopy, but it is helpful in understanding the energy relationships between what's going on at the molecular level and how much energy you have in the type of light wave or photon that you're using. And so here you have enough energy with this to excite sigma electrons or non-conjugated pi bond electrons and you can excite them so much that you end up breaking these bonds here. And that's what happens in the gamma range. The next thing that happens is you get up to very, very high energy ultraviolet light. And this is the first type of useful spectroscopy that you can use. So with ultraviolet spectroscopy, you have the ability to excite conjugated pi bonds in a conjugated system from the highest occupied orbital to the lowest unoccupied orbital. Remember, this is forming that bridge between the two adjacent p orbitals that haven't yet formed a pi bond. And you can do this even in very, very small, rigid systems. So normally, if you have a very large conjugated system, it doesn't take much energy to excite one electron from one position to the next. Resonance is easy in large conjugated systems. But with ultraviolet light, you can do this in a small conjugated system. And you can excite those electrons from one place to the next. And that is going to result in the ultraviolet light being absorbed by your sample 
which will show up in some sort of graph of absorption when you're looking at your spectroscopy data. The way to analyze that, if you see your max absorption at 171 nanometers, that's ethylene, which is simply a double bond between two carbons. And then if you see your max absorbance, and this will be plotted on a graph somewhat like this, where they look at the nanometers of the wavelength and you look at the absorbance here. If you see the biggest peak at 217 nanometers, that tells you that you're dealing with butadiene. And butadiene is the smallest possible conjugated system you can have. It has a double bond here, a single bond, and then a double bond like that. 217 nanometers will tell you that you're looking at butadiene. And if you're within a nanometer or two, there's a very, very good chance that that's butadiene as well. And then if you add 30 to 40 nanometers for each additional conjugated pi bond, you have a very, very good way of figuring out what kind of conjugated system is present in your sample. So when you're looking at ultraviolet spectroscopy, you can use the nanometer absorbance to tell you what size the conjugated system is. If it's 217, then you're dealing with butadiene, which is just a double bond, single, and then double. And then for every additional double bond in that conjugated system, add 30 to 40 nanometers, and that will tell you the maximum absorbance at that level. Also, if there are R groups intersecting the system, so let's just say here that we had some methyl group attached there, then we'll add another five nanometers. And so what is going on is as you increase the size of the conjugated system, it becomes easier and easier to find some electron in one of these double bonds that you can excite into its lowest unoccupied orbital. And the larger the system gets, the easier it is to do that. Remember that if you get to a higher wavelength, more nanometers of wavelength, that means that the frequency is going to be going down. And if the frequency goes down, that means it's lower energy light. So the highest energy light that you can use in UV spectroscopy will either be 171 nanometers for ethylene, which is simply a double bond between two carbons, or 217 for butadiene, which is the smallest possible conjugated system you can have. Double bond, single bond, and double bond. And then for every additional double bond that you add to that conjugated system, for every additional pi bond, you can add 30 to 40 nanometers to that wavelength and you'll see the maximum absorbance there. And then for every R group that intersects it, you can add about five nanometers and it's, it's an inexact science, but it is something that can give you a big clue about what's going on with your conjugated system. And so with small conjugated systems, it's not easy to excite those electrons from one position to another but ultraviolet is high enough energy that it is capable of doing that. So this is the first time where we can use spectroscopy in an analytical way in order to figure out things about our compound. And next we'll get into the visible spectrum and how you do visible light spectroscopy.